Aloha, and welcome to Ehana Kako. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. Well, everyone knows it's political season, but there are some interesting things happening that are not so ordinary. The state of Hawaii, it's no secret, is ruled in many ways by a single party. Uh, whether that's uh, Republican or Democrat, whatever that single party is, that's not always good for competition in the political world. But there is competition rising within the Democratic Party here in the state of Hawaii, and there are new voices emerging with new positions that haven't traditionally been held in the last several years by the Democrats in power. Today we have with us a Democrat contender for the office of United States Senate, Makani Christensen. He's a businessman who's very successful on the island of Maui, and he's also a graduate of Annapolis and served in the United States Marine Corps, discharged as, honorably discharged that is, as a captain. We're delighted that he's with us today and he's going to share his views on why he's running for office. Makani, aloha. Great to see you today. Oh, great to be here. Well, you know, you, you graduated from Annapolis and then you served in the U.S. Marine Corps. That was in uh, what field of duty? Uh, I was in uh, supply chain management, logistics, and I was with 3-3, 3rd Battalion, 3rd All right. So you were in Iraq and in Afghanistan as well. That's correct. I fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. And then you went into business. Yep, shortly thereafter, in 2008, started a business called Keave Adventures based on what I love to do. And Which it, is have adventure. <laughs> <laughs> or, or help other people yeah. have adventures. And it wasn't easy, though. It was started off in 2008 as a basic uh, concept. I saw a niche. I went after it and made it happen. You've done very well. You've got 13 employees. Yeah. What do you take from your military background and your business background that you bring to running for the United States Senate? So when it comes to running my business, mm -hmm. it's about leadership, no matter All where right. you are, treating people right, treating people with compassion, um, and the basics of running a business, planning, organizing, communication, execution, and belief that it will work. Um, and obviously hard work, a lot of hard work. Well, you bring a lot of leadership skills to the task as well. Yeah, it's, uh, yes. And, you know, it's having commitment to duty, to honor for thy family, thy, thy country, um, courage to make those decisions and challenge yourself mm -hmm. to go further than you ever thought you could personally go. Well, talking about challenges, you certainly have chosen a very big challenge. <laughs> you, you are running against Senator Brian Schatz, someone who has been well established in the Democratic Party, somebody who is poised, uh, well, with the resources in, in order to defend his incumbency at, at, in the United States Senate. Have you ever been given feedback from people that this is a, a Herculean task, this is an amazing thing you're doing, that, that it's almost impossible uh, you know I was I was told not to run mm -hmm. um, I was told you know you shouldn't run it's gonna ruin your business it's gonna ruin your credibility um, you shouldn't run and I was also asked to run I, it wasn't a decision that was made easy because this is a it's like putting on the uniform again yes you're representing Hawaii the mm -hmm. people of Hawaii your country at a national level and you know, anybody running for office, this, it shouldn't be a decision that's based on, I want power, I want this. It should be always people first. Well, when you look at the resource situation, Senator Schatz has a long career in politics. He's well situated in the Democratic Party. He mm -hmm. has union support. He's got large coffers in his campaign uh, account and so forth. And he, his name recognition, well, everybody knows his name in, in Hawaii. Uh, when you looked at all of that and compared them just to your resource level, uh, how is it that you decided to go ahead? So what it wasn't about the money or bringing in money. It was mm -hmm. more about the problems that Hawaii faces every day. Real problems that demand attention from our national delegates. It has to happen. Otherwise, the cost of living is not going to change. We can talk about it all day, but unless we actually make a decision, uh, actually make moves to fix those things, um, for instance, small business. Right. Small business is very difficult here in Hawaii. In fact, I think we're ranked 48, 49 
Yeah, on a good day. On a good day. <laughs> um, and it's not easy starting a business. I know That's from right. personal experience. You've got a lot of experience understanding how difficult it is yes. with our regulatory climate as well as federal regulations. That's in correct. fact, there's one in particular, now that you mentioned small business, that you talk about a lot differently than many of the leaders in the Democratic Party. And it happens to be a 1920 uh, federal law called the Jones Act. Uh, Tell us what you think about that. So right now, the Jones Act actually uh, increases cost of living by 30%. You know, shipping, and so that impacts not only small businesses; it, it impacts, impacts the consumer. It impacts everything in in this state. Right, and when we talk about sustainability, mm -hmm. for example, we're looking at farms, small farmers. Uh -huh. The cost of running a farm and actually ordering supplies from mainland distribution points to Hawaii it only adds to the overall cost. That's right, and, and while we don't necessarily know exactly what that cost is, it's up there, people feel it and yep. so forth. So what's fundamentally wrong about this Jones Act? So it doesn't allow that free market um, competition. So, you know, it's, it's a regulated price, U.S. ships, U.S. ports. Now, if we can potentially modify it for Hawaii, okay, then we actually have a chance to reduce the cost of living and gain supplies from other um, uh, venues that will basically help the people of Hawaii. Well, you talk about free market competition here, but you're not saying what some people often talk about, and that is repeal this nearly 100-year-old federal act. You, you said modify. You, you seem to take a, a more middle-of-the-road approach toward it. Yeah, you know, whenever you mm -hmm. deal with change, mm -hmm. change is something that it's hard for people to accept, uh -huh. no matter what you do. And as far as this uh, the Jones Act, it's been in place for a very long time. To have the individuals, the unions, the shipping industry to come to the table and say, you know what, I agree, let's, let's make it right for the people of Hawaii, let's reduce the cost of shipping, and this is how we propose we do it. And we want to do it together. Well, Makani, you know, you're taking a position that differs from the leadership of the Democratic Party, but there are a good number of younger Democrats in office who take your stand. But in another issue, there are some very senior members of the Democratic Party who seem to agree with you. And I'm talking about Governor Ariyoshi, uh, Go Governor Caetano, and even Senator Akaka. And, and that has to do with the, the vast body of water that oh, surrounds yeah. the, right. the Hawaiian Islands into the Pacific. Uh, we, we're looking at a very aggressive act now by our federal government to expand its jurisdiction over what we call a national monument. Yeah, and tell, uh, tell us a little about that because so, you have some strong views on that. So basically, what's happening right now is you have a um, national marine monument on uh, Northwest Hawaiian Islands that circumference 50 miles uh -huh. around the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. That's right. And what's being proposed as part of a legacy project to a legacy project now. All right. Okay? That means that we're going to be paying for it forever. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, it, and it's and it's a personal uh -huh. legacy project, you know. And it's under the Antiquities Act to expand the, the area from that 50-mile radius to a 200-mile radius around the islands. Now, that's the size of Texas, California, Oregon, and Washington. So now, in a lot of ways, this is something that if you're in favor of the expansion of federal power over a state, you, you'd be cheering on. And right. if, if you, in, in some way your contracts were dependent upon that, you'd be cheering that on and so forth. But you come from the point of view of a small businessman who, who doesn't see this kind of federal action as benefiting the locals. Right. And so, one, there's no actual evidence that shows that anything that... Basically, it's, uh, we collect 1.5% of the fish from the uh -huh. Pacific. The rest is caught from our counterparts in Asia. That's right. And they're actually coming into our USS water, the EEZ. It, in other words, you don't accept the claim that our fishing around the Hawaiian Islands is depleting the Pacific Ocean. Not even close. And, you know, also the other aspect of it is uh, we have a Hawaiian group that's saying it's a cultural area. It's that's cultural. Right. If you... If you've been 50 miles out, it's blue water. <laughs> so I'm not sure what these individuals are talking about, but they're bringing up a case with unfounded documentation, and it will affect the people of Hawaii. People will lose their jobs. The price of fish will go up. We'll end up buying gas fish from um, Asia for $25 a pound. And rather than having our longline fleet uh, be sustainable, because... 
you're not only affecting the long line fleet, you're affecting all the distributors, you're affecting hotels, you're affecting the overall um, dependence on the mainland for food. Well, two former Democrat governors and a former United States Senator, Senator Akaka, agree with you. Yeah. They agree that we should not have this expansion of federal the territory in federal waters and, and in many ways younger Democrats and the Democratic Party now in power it seem to be out of sync with that it seems as though you might actually represent would you think some of the more classical tr democratic values as opposed to some of the more recent ones yeah you know it's uh, from what I've seen from the Democratic Party it's, there's a split mm -hmm. um, pr progressive versus conservatives and people that want to just tear the system apart you know, being a Democrat, I'm proud to be a Democrat. And at the same time, you know, the leadership, um, we just changed leadership. And, you know, I believe that it's going to take some time to smooth out all the wrinkles. Well, what's interesting here is you say you're a Democrat and proud to be a Democrat. I'm listening to you on the first two issues we talk about, yeah. modify the Jones Act and restrict federal overreach within yeah. the state. You, you, you sound just like a Republican as well. It, it's as if the, the positions you take aren't dependent upon party branding. And they're not. It has to be dependent on the people, mm -hmm. the people that we sign up to serve. Because it, it is. You, you sacrifice everything for the people. Well, Makani, let's get back to the question of, okay. of your relationship to the challenge, to the, your challenge to the incumbent now. Uh, Senator Schatz uh, is completing his first term. So it really, it's, it, this election will be a test because generally we tend to think here in Hawaii once somebody has been in Congress or Senate for a while, they're somewhat vested. So That's this right. would be a window of opportunity to challenge that. How, how do you compare yourself uh, in this race to, to the positions that Senator Schatz takes? Um, you know, so, well, as you know, well written um, in the Honolulu Star advertiser mm -hmm. that his main priority for Hawaii was climate change. All right. My main priority is the people of Hawaii. Mm. Um, where climate change, and when we talk about, so the difference would be sustainability. Is it a fashionable sustainability or is it true sustainability for Hawaii? Well, there's some terms here that have almost become sacred buzzwords right. amongst many people. And I know that you, you like to look for the substance behind them. When you think of sustainability, what role do you think the government needs to play? We need to definitely make it cheaper for farmers. We encourage our fishermen to obviously fish sustainably. Mm -hmm. um, this expansion is definitely not part of that, that plan. Um, we also encourage the access to our mountains for hunters. So um, on top of this, you know, I started the Hunting Farm and Fishing Association. That's right. And the Hunting Farm and Fishing Association basically gave the people of Hawaii a voice. The people that are down in the dirt digging the people that are up in the mountains looking for food to feed their families, the fisherman that goes to the beach to bring back a couple fish for the rest of his ohana. Those are the people we represent that didn't have time to look up and see what was changing around them. And when that happened, when I saw people losing more than they possibly ever dreamed that they would, their way of life disappeared in a second. We decided to formulate a cohesive unit of individuals from throughout the state, increasing communication, basically letting people know what's going on. So you've been a networker in many ways, and, yeah. and I know that during your campaign you've been traveling the islands, meeting with many of I these people. Been. We're going to come back right after a short break, and okay. I'm with Makani Christensen, who is a candidate for United States Senate. Don't go away. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii's Ehana Kako. We'll be right back. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I serve as senator from the Big Island on the Kona side, and I'm also an emergency room physician. My program here on Think Tech is called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'll have guests that should be interesting to you twice a month. We'll talk about issues that range from mental health care to drug addiction to our health care system and any challenges that we face here in Hawaii. We hope you'll join us. Again, thanks for supporting Think Tech. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, meeting people we may not have otherwise met, helping us understand and appreciate the good things about Hawaii. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Aloha. My name is John Waihe, and I actually had a small part to do with what's happening today. Served actually in public office. 
But if you don't already know that, here's a chance to learn more about what's happening in our state by joining me for Talk Story with John Waihe every other Monday. Thank you, and I look forward to your seeing us in the future. Welcome back to the concluding portion of Ehana Kako here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. And again, I'm Kili Iakina with the Grassroot Institute. We call our program Ehana Kako uh, after a very well known saying here in Hawaii, Epule Kako. Epule Kako means let's pray together. The kako is a way of saying we do it inclusively with all people. So at the Grassroot Institute, we love to say ehana kako. Let's work together. Let's work together for a better government, society, and economy. Think of the terrible alternative of not working together. And so we're very proud of the fact that we work together with the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. And my, hats go off, my hat goes off <laughs> to Jay Fidel, the producer uh, uh, in general here, as well as all of the great team who put this program on. 35 hours a week of original content coming out from Hawaii. You can see it at thinktechhawaii.com. Now back to U.S. Senate candidate Makani Christensen. Well, Makani, you've really been off a big challenge running against an incumbent, uh, Senator Schatz, and you, you, you say you do this because you really want to fight for the people, and one group of those people happen to be the business people whose voices you feel have not been heard. What are the challenges that business people, small business people in particular, face here in the state that you think you could change in the U.S. Senate? Well, you know, one of the biggest things is mm -hmm. to encourage rather than discourage. And when I say that, I'm talking about a couple instances that happened within the last uh -huh. six months. One was a blatant attack on VRBOs, the uh, attack on by uh, Senator Schatz. Well, let's go back to that first one. You're talking about what has been emerging here as the shared economy. Right. Uh, everything from people sharing uh, an empty seat in their car through the, through the ride share programs or right. sharing an empty bedroom uh, uh, going online and advertising that and so what are your concerns about this well when it comes from the federal government this should be a, a handled by the state uh, the state should be able to better manage the VRBO um, and uh, bed and breakfast arena as well as uber uh, when in the federal government overreaches without being really in touch with what's going on and saying this is going to be the solution to our housing crisis and our cost of living, then we, have, we should really re-examine who we're uh, putting into office. Well, I hear t two strains of thought over here that coming through, both of them complementary. Uh, the first one is you care about the economic impact upon the people. Absolutely. Uh, the, the, indivi the individual's rights to conduct business, make it a little extra money, a few dollars and so forth, and the availability of that. But the second thing I'm hearing you say, correct me if I'm wrong here, I'm hearing you say that you have a strong preference for the state having rights rather than the federal government coming in and taking those rights from the state. Are you a strong believer in putting power back into the hands of the states? Well, at, in this case, yes. Mm -hmm. um, the state would have a better uh, know-how to challenge the, the issues that come up on a daily basis. You know, if we're, we're doing an overreach by the federal government here in Hawaii, then... I just got to stop you there for a second, and then I'll let you continue. Yeah, no problem. Overreach by the federal government. You sure aren't talking Democratese. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I thought the mantra had been for many years, let's get as much federal funding as we can get. But you're talking about, about the fact that there have to be limits. Well, let me let you, you continue to yeah. talk about what are your concerns about that federal overreach? So when there's, see, what is, what's happening is it's hurting small business. Mm -hmm. So when uh, federal overreach impacts our businesses here in Hawaii and impacts the way we do business, then that's not a proper way to... Uh, use, uh, utilize the federal government. Now you've got concerns also of the federal government's policies uh, toward agriculture. For example, all the rules about clean water uh, sounds good, but in many ways they regulate the state in a way that, that the federal government couldn't understand, or the Food Safety Act and so forth. So what are your concerns about farmers being able to survive with these federal regulations? Well, as you know, um, the cost uh, to do business in Hawaii is mm -hmm. already extreme. We don't have farmers. We need farmers mm -hmm. here in Hawaii. And that would be also a, a, if we can at the national level, encourage farming to 
Um, I'm not going to just say throw money at it, but come up sure. with a well-executed plan on how can we make Hawaii more sustainable. Encourage those that produce food to come to Hawaii and let's make the land produce for all people in Hawaii. Then, then we're actually talking about true sustainability. Um, also, when it comes to uh, uh, agriculture, you know, there's a difference between everybody's fighting the GMO process mm -hmm. and fighting the, uh, you know, small farmers, and then you got the organic farmers. Right. It's going to be imperative that all farmers work together to come up with a solution to fix what we have right now. Well, we've certainly seen a good deal of extremism in these battles between environmentalists and small farmers. Yeah. And, and uh, I think you're absolutely right. We have to find a middle ground in which we can, can wor wor work together. Uh, how, how would you bring about creating that opportunity to work together toward a common end as opposed to the divisiveness that it exists now? I believe that the best way to do this is to have a common theme. And the common theme would be producing food for Hawaii. And if you're producing food for Hawaii and everybody comes to the table, you can actually come up with some great ideas from the farmers, organic, non-organic. And the fighting is just dividing our community and the people of Hawaii, where people have the opportunity. I mean, you look at Kauai, for example, you have an area of 5,000 individuals in on the west side. If the GMO crops and the seed companies left, the economy on the west side would implode on itself without no recourse to the people there. So when individuals fight the GMO issue, come up with a solution on what is the best way for the state to uh, go about and make it right rather than just say it's wrong all the time, what would be the best solution? Instead of, you know, because if we allow Kauai to implode on itself, we allow Molokai to implode on itself, and people don't have jobs. You know, you're looking at a thousand jobs on Kauai, a thousand jobs on Molokai, or less. How does that benefit our economy and the people of Hawaii? You were talking earlier about sustainability. Mm -hmm. Sustainability would apply definitely to agriculture yeah. and agricultural practices. And yet you're, you're cautioning uh, against the, the, the extremism that would say no GMO or no, uh, no, no practices that don't hit this certain mark. We've got to find a way to work together. Yeah, absolutely. Working together has also put Hawaii into a, a very successful place for many, many years in providing health care. We had one of the highest rates of coverage in the nation in our public-private partnership here that, that required uh, businesses to actually pay for the health care of their full-time employees. Right. And, and then while we were held up as a model, really, across the, the country, there were five other states studying our system, thinking of using it. We had a federal law called the um, Affordable Care Act, yep. often known affectionately as Obamacare, uh, which sent us into a downward spiral in terms of our own he public health care system, our health care system, public-private partnership, and, and uh, it left a lot of damage, cost us a lot of money, and we're in the aftermath of reconstructing our coverage here in Hawaii. What are your thoughts about the, the Affordable Care Act? So right now, what we're looking at is mm -hmm. um, it has to be ratified. It has to absolutely be ratified. There's people right now not receiving help because if you look at the Medicare, Medicare's funding went towards the general overall uh -huh. of um, health care. And our kupuna suffer because of it. They, he, doctors no longer want to take the Medicare because it's not pain. And you meant it has to be fixed. It has to be fixed. That's right. That's correct. And, you know, th th this is something. A lot of people are afraid. I think in, in the political season, especially in races for, for U.S. Senate and Congress across the country and, and perhaps in Hawaii, a, there, a lot of scare is interjected into the uh, uh, campaigning, that, that if we tamper with this at all, if we update it, as you're talking about, it, fix it, somehow the, the benefits of the seniors are going to be lost. Yeah. And then anyone who wants to bring about reform is often portrayed as somebody who is threatening the Medicare benefits of the seniors. But what, what is your response to that when, when that's well, leveled against you? Well, you know, Whenever you bring a new idea into, um, 
fruition, if you will. You have this idea, you have this concept. It's not going to be perfect, but you work to make sure that it gets there. I mean, look at the uh, Constitution. Yeah. I mean, we've amended it. That's right. We've fixed it. I mean, there's been 11,538 attempts to amend the Constitution to make it better. great document. Imagine where we'd be if we didn't have those amendments. Right, exactly. We couldn't even talk about it without the First Amendment. <laughs> <laughs> so you look, at, you look at that concept. Is Yeah, we, we started it, but we can make it better. We can see where the flaws are and say, you know what? My constituents back home are not getting health care like they used to, and we need to fix this. Hawaii, I mean, I got 10 kupunas calling me up, and what are we going to do about it? Well, that's an Im important value to us in Hawaii. Yep. Glad to hear you would be committed to, to in working the very best solution for our kupuna from Washington, D.C. Yep. Now, let me throw you a tough question. This one's a little hairy. Politicians have to take a poll as to who they're talking to before they answer it. We're talking about amendments. Let's go to the Second Amendment. Okay. Okay. Nobody is blind to the violence that we've seen across the country and the battles over the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms that have emerged. You happen to be part of an association, the founder of one that is called Hunting, uh, farming. farming and Fishing. That's correct. Hunters, of course, need to have the appropriate weapons, to, the appropriate guns and so forth to use. What are your thoughts on Second Amendment in Hawaii? The Second Amendment should be preserved. Uh, we have the toughest gun laws uh, in Hawaii mm -hmm. as we speak. One of the um, rules that came out from the state recently affected a lot of people that, uh, for example, our military. You know, I've been in contact with a lot of our veterans who sh shoot guns and also came back from Iraq and Afghanistan that suffer from post-traumatic stress. Uh, because of the new law that says, you know, if you have a um, mental illness, which is post-traumatic stress, you have to turn in your weapons. Right. And this has ramifications in the next 10, 15 years or, and shorter, where as an outlet, they would go and shoot guns. Now, people wanting to go get help or need help will no longer go and get help because they like their weapons. And also, you know, we have to preserve the fact that, you know, hunters and, and sports enthusiasts use these weapons to, um, well, the hunters go out there and catch food, and the sports enthusiasts use it for competition, and, you know, they have a, they have a rifle team up at Kamehameha Schools. Well, just listening to you, I'm somewhat marveling. I'm thinking, here's a Democrat who is pro-Second Amendment, who is for changing the Jones Act, who is pro-small business, <laughs> and so forth. Well, as we close today, let's yeah. talk about the party. What kind of reaction are you getting from party members as to your stands? Um, you know, I've, I've gotten the um, mixed reviews, if you will, from Democrats, Republicans, and, you know, a lot of what Daniel Inouye stood for, I mean, I've seen his decisions that he's yes. made, and a lot of the decisions he's made, I would probably have made the same, same decision. Well, that's a good note to close on, Daniel Inouye. And, uh, I mean, he's a I'm, warrior. Yes, I mean, he's been absolutely. there. I've been there, so. Makani, I wish you the best in your run. Thank you for being on the program today. Appreciate it. My guest today, Makani Christensen, candidate for United States Senate running against Brian Schatz. We'll be watching carefully and see what happens and uh, also keeping an eye on Makani as his career goes forward. Until next time, I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute, wishing you a hanakako. Let's work together. Aloha. Thank you for watching. Thank you.